Hi, in this video I want to take our uh, introduction of stochastic processes a little bit further, um, a couple extensions, and then start thinking about how we're going to characterize these processes. So first an aside, um, so we introduced in the previous video um, scalar um, processes with scalar parameters, but we can do a couple um, other extensions to that. So one is uh, what we'll call a random field. So a random field is a process that has two parameters rather than t of time. We could have um, two parameters. Oftentimes, this is spatial dimensions. So I could think about, um, you know, say the bearing capacity of soil at a site that I'm looking to build on, and as a function of the x y coordinates um, of the surface of the soil, I could have a varying um, bearing capacity. For example, I could go in three dimensions even, and I could go as a function of depth as well at a soil characterization. So we could have an x y z process, um, but uh, we will do. Uh, we'll, we'll point out a couple things where we can do these spatial um, random field problems. Um, and a, a lot of the ideas from random processes carry over to random fields, but that's, that's kind of one extension. A second extension is that the, vec the random process could take a vector value. So generally we'll think about a scalar valued x of t, um, but we could think about um, vectors. So um, one example would be multi-component earthquake ground motion. So I, I drew a cartoon in the previous video of acceleration versus time of an earthquake ground motion, but the, the ground is going to shake in three dimensions uh, in an earthquake. And so if I change the dire direction that I'm looking at, the shaking will be different. Uh, this figure on the um, slide shows a three component recording of a ground motion. So we have a, a north an east west um, shaking, a north south shaking, and then a vertical shaking here from a recording. And so you could think about having a, a, an X of T, which takes three different values at each point in time, reflecting the amplitude of shaking at those three different um, directions. So we can also have these vector random fields, right? So as a, um, you could think even more generally, this, this ground shaking is going to vary as a function of time, but it's also going to vary as a function of space where you record it. So if I move in space a little bit, the recording of the ground shaking would be different. So I could have ground shaking that's a function of x and y coordinates, as well as t time. And it could take three um, values reflecting the th directions of shaking in the three different directions. Right? So I could have vector outputs as well as um, random fields or random processes or both. So, so we can extend these things out further. Um, but it, but I'll, I'll pull it back now moving forward just to thinking about scalar processes as a function of time. OK, so now let's talk about how are we going to specify a stochastic process. Right? So um, if I, if I, and to help uh, with this story, I'm going to use this cartoon a few times. So this is a just a picture of uh, a stochastic process. So we can't really draw a stochastic process that's itself just yet, because it takes random values. But here's a picture of six realizations. So they're, they're labeled kind of x1 to x6 up the side. So if, if, if we took an observation of this ra random process, um, you know, it would be varying values in time. And then so the, <clears throat> the horizontal direction here is, the, is a parameter, so time. and um, so we can think about, you know, if I wanted to describe the process that's producing these realizations, what do I need to describe? Right? So the first thing I need is, is the probability distribution um, at a given point in time t, right? So there's this kind of um, time t at 10 that's kind of marked with some dashes. So if I was thinking about it time t, I'd say, well, what's the probability distribution for the values that x might take at, at time 10? Right? So I need the distribution. of x of t um, at each t. Right, so, and I could characterize that by like a probability density function. And let's uh, let's do it this do it this way. So I'm gonna I'm gonna write probability density function of x at some specific time t. And I'm going to evaluate that for all different values of x for what for any kind of x value that that could take. I want to know that. Um, so that's that's something I'd like to know. But that doesn't f completely describe the process though, because that's only at a specific point in time t. And even if I have it for all points in time t, I don't know the the joint behavior at multiple points in time t. Right. So additionally, I'd like to know um, for I can think about it like some moments, like the correlation. coefficient of x at time t1 
and x at time t2. And I need that for all t1 and t2, right? So for any pairs of time, um, I would need that correlation coefficient. Okay, so that's a moment, and that would uh, um, characterize a little bit the dependency. So if I'm looking at a Gaussian process, then that's actually enough information, right? So we were talking about that multivariate normal distribution, and I need to know, in order to specify that multivariate normal distribution, I need kind of the mean and standard deviation of each entry of x. That was the mean vector and the diagonal of the covariance matrix. So that would, that would give me the, um, enough to talk about the marginal distribution of x at any point in time t. And then that covariance matrix also requires these correlation coefficients for all pairs of time t. So even if we go to the continuous time case, that's, that's sufficient. So uh, let me maybe uh, note on the side here that this is sufficient for a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process is a process by which the x values at all points in time are uh, multivariate normal. So if I have one of those processes, conveniently, the, the two things in these brackets are sufficient for me. Um, if I don't have a Gaussian process, this isn't enough, right? So the correlation coefficient is just a moment. It's not a complete descriptor of joint behavior. And, and further, in processes in general, having pairwise um, joint distributions is not sufficient. I need something higher order as well. So um, in general, I need a joint distribution um, of x at time t1, x at time t2, x at time t3, dot, 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 x at time tn for n equals infinity, right? So I need, as a function of an infinite number of times in, in this continuously time-varying process, I need the joint distribution <laughs> for that, right? So, um, and, and in case that's not um, apparent to you, that's hard, right? That's, that's a very hard thing to specify. So uh, our, our preference would be to lean on Gaussian processes for lots of our studies if we can, because it's, even though the, the first two points are kind of non-trivial to specify, there are ways to, to do this in a convenient way. Recognizing that that's a special case, you know, there, are, there is this more general case that um, some processes might need us to go to. So. Um, so that's kind of uh, something to start thinking about, is how are we going to describe these and, and why is, is this Gaussian world so appealing? A second thing to think about is, you know, how are we going to estimate these characterizations um, from some data, right? And so I want to talk about ensemble averages versus time averages. So this is kind of an uh, important concept for us. So I've got these six realizations and they're, they take values that are varying in time. And um, so I've got all these this data and then the question is you know, how can I use this data to, to understand the characteristics of this stochastic process that's producing this thing? So one thing I can do is I could say, well, let's, I'm really interested in at time 10. And I want to know what's the probability distribution at time 10, right? So I could take these six realizations and, and more of them if I have more. And I take the, those six values across all of those um, realizations at time 10. And I could say, look, I've got um, kind of this range of values that I'm observing. And so this is a, I've got kind of x values and then I've got kind of this PDF representing the, the probability density function at time 10 as a function of x, right? And I could try to estimate this thing by based on my ensemble of realizations, okay? So this is what we call an ensemble average. All right, so I could, I could literally take an average to find like the mean value of the process. 
or I could take a, a standard deviation to find the standard deviation of the process or, or you know, compute a histogram, things like that. But I'm, the, the, the key is that I'm using an, an ensemble of realizations. I'm using multiple realizations. Okay. So in order to do this, this requires multiple realizations of this process x at time 10. So I need, you know, in this case, I've got six realizations. Uh, you know, if I had more, that would be great too. And so sometimes we can do that, right? We can we can think about well, let's get a bunch of like observations of, of earthquake ground motions under similar conditions, and we'll take a look at kind of what's happening as time evolves. If I'm trying to do this to look at a stochastic process for like the mean temperature on Earth or something as a function of time, right? I only have one Earth, and so. Um, I can't get an ensemble of those averages, right? Or if I'm trying to do a um, process model for the value of the New York Stock Exchange, um, uh, you know, a collection of, of stocks from the New York Stock Exchange, I only have one New York Stock Exchange, so I don't have an ensemble, right? So the, in those cases where we don't have an ensemble or we don't want to work this way, we're, we're a little stuck with regard to these ensemble averages, something we can do is we could take our one realization of, you know, mean temperature on Earth or or stock market value or something like that. And I could I could move along time and I could say, well, across all the time points that I have observations of, let me let me process those up and I'll say, look, I've got I've got values X here, and I've got um, probability density for X. And let me let me look at a probability distribution this way. Right? So this is what we call a time average. So um, it, the, the benefit here is that it only requires one realization. Um, so that's very convenient, right? Especially in the cases where we only have one realization. It also, however, requires ergodicity. Um, and so that's a, that's a characteristic that we're going to look at more formally uh, in a future video. But it, it basically is a, a characteristic that ensures that a time average taken in this way is equivalent to an ensemble average taken at a single point in time. And you might intuitively expect that like sometimes that might be okay, right? If I took a, a year of data from like the, um, you know, heights of waves on a beach or something like that, maybe that would be a um, reasonable way to represent the variability of um, waves at any particular future point in time. Um, but you can imagine like with the stock market or with the earth temperature, like that might feel a little problematic of like if the process is changing in time, um, you know, how do, I, how do I take an average out of that um, data and use that to, to characterize some other point in time? Um, and so that, and that's because ergodicity is not present in some processes. So at, at this point, I just want to point out that there's more than one way to process this data to try to look at characteristics of stochastic processes, these ensemble averages and time averages. And um, we will revisit this ergodicity characteristic more formally in a future video. Okay, so that's a good stopping place for now.